So whenever I'm meeting a new person, whether it be a more casual hangout where I'm first meeting a mutual friend, a date, or when I'm being detained at the psychiatric ward, typically one of my go-to icebreakers is pretty simple, but one I think can say a whole lot about somebody's character. What is your favorite animal? If I phased into existence right by you and asked you that right now, if you didn't instantaneously blow my head off, a few creatures may pop up to mind. Or maybe you've thought about this and officially championed one as your all-time favorite. However, after asking this question to like, a billion people, I feel pretty confident in reaching and stating a pretty fair analytical conclusion. With this sample size in mind, I can officially say that a lot of people's favorite animals are just incredibly droll. Don't get me wrong, sometimes I get the really unique answer, and to an extent I'm glad there are standard picks that people tend to gravitate to. If I was talking to somebody and their answer was, uh, oh, the Chinese crocodile wizard, also known as the Shinisaurus crocodilurus, I would probably just stand up and leave. However, like, 70 to 80% of the time it's just dogs, or cats. And they usually don't even mention a breed or a species. Like, don't get me wrong, I absolutely adore my bug. I try to spoil him every day, and he's kind of one of the main channel mascots for a reason. He's just a cute little man who has all the qualities that a cute little man should have. But is bug representative of an entire species? No. And likewise, I can say with a relative amount of confidence that Snuffles over here isn't exactly a goddamn jaguar or a mountain lion. But anyways, for the longest time in my life, I actually had a pretty basic answer to that initial question. The African fat tail Gecko. These little guys are insanely cute, make great pet reptiles, especially for beginners, you can easily handle them due to their calm and laid-back nature, and they're able to just do their own thing without killing me or instantaneously perishing. However, in recent years, these little guys that have been my number one for the vast majority of my life has been dethroned, and I'm not going to give you any more suspense, you clicked on the video and you know where this is going to be going. The coelacanth as an animal, in my slightly biased personal opinion, shouldn't exist. By most conceivable metrics, it kind of just fails at... everything. I've never seen a monstrosity quite as abhorrent and quite as dumb as this foul beast, and for a solid weekend I kept looking more and more and more into this animal. But the more I researched into it and the more I learned about it, the more I realized, I love it. I think it's terrible, but I think it's perfect. Here's why. So let's go back in time a few days. You know, just a little bit before, uh, 400 million BC. In case you need a helpful reminder to jog your memory, you were not alive during 400 million BC. Do you know what was, though? The god damn coelacanth. So you may be curious, what did it look like? I mean, 400 million years is a lot of time. Even more so in the sense of evolution. Regardless of your beliefs, humanity has been around for less than a percent of that. And I'm gonna go ahead and say it immediately, we have progressed a little bit further than hit thing with pointy rock until it die. Well, luckily for you, I have an answer to that question. So let me go ahead and pull up this image and, uh, transition it to highlight some differences over the years. Oh, uh, what's that? You, uh, you don't really see the difference? Oh. Yeah, uh, that's because it hasn't really fucking evolved in 400 million years. And I know, somebody is going to immediately head into the comments and valiantly type up a 10 paragraph essay going, Oh, but Davey, it actually evolved over the years, it's just incredibly slow and very slight, and... Yeah, 
that's cool and all, but at this point, no it really hasn't. I know from a sheerly objective sense that this is wrong, but I don't believe that a minor change in routine or possibly tactics over the course of hundreds of millions of years is an evolution. I genuinely believe that I have evolved more than the coelacanth when I paused the scripting process in this video to get some food, and then realized when I poured a bowl of Reese's Puffs that I didn't have milk in the fridge. Apparently, the coelacanth was just way too smart and believed it evolved into its perfect form 400 million years ago. But real quick, let's actually pause on that. Here's a graph I masterfully constructed in Microsoft Paint. If you don't know what you're looking at, I don't really know either, but we're going to assume that this right here is a coelacanth's brain case, yeah? Now go ahead and take a second and ponder to yourself how much of this monstrosity's brain case is actually full of brain. Guess a percentage and keep it in mind. Or alternatively, pause the video and leave a passive-aggressive comment. Either way, I can't really stop you. Alrighty, uh, you ready? Got it? Well, if you guessed 98.5%, guess what, fuckaroo? You're entirely wrong. Because that's actually the percentage of its brain case that is full of fat. Its actual brain tissue makes up an incredible, healthy, r slash atheism defining 1.5% of its brain case. I guess it just has a natural safety helmet, so its 1.5% brain doesn't go donk really hard on a rock and instantaneously perish or something. Look, I'm not a psychologist, but I kind of get it. If you have very little of something, you may very well be bound to be more protective of it. But there is such a thing as diminishing returns. You don't guard your last box of cosmic brownies with a Boeing AH-64 Apache. Or at least you shouldn't. Hopefully. Anyways, on to the next point. Despite the fact that it has remained mostly the same for 400 million years, it actually had a lot of things going for it to become a land animal. In fact, for quite a while, there was a pretty common hypothesis that it may have been a shared ancestor between terrestrial and marine vertebrates because of their lobed fins. This ended up not being the case. You are not looking at Grandpa currently, but... Again, maybe I'm just being uncharacteristically optimistic for something that doesn't deserve it, but it actually had a shot of being... You know hopefully less of a disaster, on land. Anyways, I had a cool segment here where I scripted out something along the lines of, it's not really a shocking revelation to learn that these things went extinct 66 million years ago, right? But I'm starting to realize since videos are inherently a visual medium, I couldn't get away with that unless I exclusively used terrible CGI footage of coelacanths for the entire video. And despite how incredible that sounds, unfortunately that's just not going to work, so instead we're going to go for some roleplay, I guess. So let's go ahead and flash back to 1938. Although it's not an exceptionally high chance, there is a chance that some of you may have been alive for this, unlike 400 million BC. Anyways, you're a local fisherman. And rather shockingly enough, considering your occupation, you caught a fish. However, this fish in particular appears to have an extremely mild case of fucking stupid. I don't want it here, I would prefer it to be anywhere else, so, I'm going to go ahead and call the science team because I would really prefer it if this monstrosity was anywhere else other than my general proximity. Ta-da, Lazarus Taxon. Now, this may sound kind of... fine, I suppose? I mean, it is kind of sad and anticlimactic that a fish that is 400 million years old was just casually fished up one day, but... 
It is a fish. It makes sense that it would be found by a fisher man. But to be fair to Vasilikanth, not a whole lot of rediscoveries were all that eventful. I mean, it was no Laotian rock rat that was rediscovered from a meat market and owl shit. But something about how casual and boring the second discovery of the second species of coelacanth was just feels very... fitting. So, we're going to go ahead and roleplay again. Your name is Mark Erdman. You are a doctor. And this right here is your wife. You and your wife decided to travel to Indonesia on your honeymoon. While you're traveling through a market at the lovely destination of I am not going to pronounce this, you see this really weird fish. But, uh, it kind of looks like that one other fish, but this one is brown. It's not blue. Huh. That may be, like, an entirely new species of that revolutionary animal that's being researched, yeah? We're going to go ahead and pause right here. What do you do? If your answer was something along the lines of seduce the coelacanth, you're absolutely psychotic. What they did instead was take a few pictures and just... left. I guess to be absolutely fair, it was at a market and it was sold. And two months after the trip, he went back to do some more research, but to get the full context on why I think this is just a perfect discovery, we need to really zero in on where they found it. So, up to this point you might have been thinking to yourself, eh, well these abominations of nature may be awful and they really shouldn't exist. Maybe they taste good? Nope. Nah. Incorrect. Shame on you. Bad. This creature's flesh is covered in high amounts of oil, wax esters, mucus, and urea that give it a foul odor, flavor, and cause sickness if you were to somehow eat it. They actually taste so bad that in the Comros, where coelacanths were frequently caught, they're called Gombesa. Gombesa literally just translates to worthless or taboo. Also, off-topic, but while I was trying to look this up, the first article I found was a Gizmodo article by our guy Keith titled, What is it like to dine on a prehistoric beast? And the headline for the coelacanth's introduction is, without satire, Rediscovery of the Hated Fish. How fitting. But what I find hilarious is that their name implies that the species was found way before their formal discovery and given the name. However, if you can actually believe it, it gets even worse than worthless. So, fishermen knew for a fact that most people wouldn't buy these things if their name was literally taboo because it tasted so bad. So they decided to give this species an entirely brand new name. Because they hoped with a more alluring name, with the fish's inherent rarity, that they would be able to attract more buyers and turn a profit on these usually worthless catches. Eventually they decided on the King of the Seas, a very formal name. And with that name change, I say this with complete sincerity, with my source being the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, allowed the fishermen to occasionally sell the fish to the Chinese who believed it was a deep sea grouper and that consuming it would enhance their libido. I don't really have a whole lot to say. And... I guess on a non-human note, they may miraculously taste so awful that it might contribute to their survival? Research and observations are, of course, very limited, but the only predator that we believe may prey on coelacanths are sharks. 
That's because we have seen shark bite marks on seal camps before, and they do panic and flee whenever an unknown entity approaches them, namely in this example, divers or submersibles, which may indicate that something is capable of eating it, but other than that, we don't really know. So to be honest, my headcanon of real life is that seal cans miraculously taste so awful that they're technically an apex predator. Is this the case? Probably not, but simultaneously, it would be kind of funny. Anyways, I'm bad at transitions. You may be thinking to yourself, okay. But if it was believed to be extinct for two quintillion years, how come we never saw it? The reason is, put simply, these things are antisocial bastards that suck at making kids. For that first part, not only are these things nocturnal, but they live very, very deep underwater in caves and crevices. They also tend to share caves with each other, so... When the seal camp decides it had a rough time existing, doing nothing, sometimes it'll just go into a cave and find another seal camp. Then that seal camp might invite another seal camp who invites another seal camp who invites their seal camps, and whoopsie doopsie, the entire cave is seal camps, all staring at a wall, menacingly. Five inches apart, though, because they're not gay, I guess. Apparently, if any of them ever make contact, they're just Audi 5000, but that's fine, I guess. Outside of this, do you know what they do to break the monotony, though? Headstands. Originally, I had a few paragraphs here describing why I don't really know why they headstand, but think it's pretty damn baller regardless, but guess what, bozo? News update. It's a hunting technique. This thing headstands as a hunting technique. In fact, with this discovery, when correlated with the fact that a lot of its weight is distributed in its head and tail, means that the coelacanth, as we know it, may have reached its final form many years ago because it perfected its headstand hunting technique. I'm not going to lie, that's sick as hell. And I feel like we're branding the entire video now, but we're in too deep. Do you know what isn't in too deep, though? The seal canth. Because, uh, this is the part in scripting where I had to get into the second point I mentioned eight years earlier. Seal canth sex. It's bizarre. Not necessarily the sex, although I'm going to say I don't think a single living human being has ever seen it, so it could just be raw as hell, but... Hey, uh, future Davey here. While trying to find more older footage of seal camp, since modern footage is actually very limited, I found a B-movie from 1980 called Humanoids of the Deep. Where the general plot is that seal camps, that, for some reason, live near the United States now, ate a bunch of mutated salmon and hyper-evolved into humanoid creatures. Of course, this new evolution, naturally, began to crave one thing in particular. The violation and impregnation of women, of course. But not just coelacanth women. What do you think I am, stupid? Human woman. Despite my commitment to this fish, I didn't watch this movie, but I think there's a plot twist at the end where the human woman begin to give birth to more hyper-evolved seal camps. I don't really know, and I'm not going to know. Maybe we should just be glad that they haven't evolved in 400 million years. Anyways, back to you, Past Davy. More so, their babies and other gestational nonsense. So, first and foremost, take all this with a grain of salt. As I implied earlier, I've actually had to revise the script multiple times over the course of many months, but... Coelacanths don't lay eggs. 
Instead, they hatch life young in their bodies, which is strange, but not completely out of the ordinary. For example, a ton of shark species do it the exact same way. But how long are they pregnant? So let me go ahead and pull up some facts. I'm pretty sure that basking sharks hold the record of the longest pregnancy at a solid two to three and a half years. However, for a more well-documented case, elephants hold the longest pregnancy of all mammals at 22 months. So with this in mind, how long do you think it takes a coelacanth? Just go ahead and guess and keep a number in mind. Alrighty, you ready? Five years. This thing is pregnant for five fucking years. These things have the longest gestation period of any animal, and they look like this. Also, these things just casually live up to a hundred years old because I don't know. And I have to concede, it's kind of a good thing because just like your average League of Legends user, they don't reach maturity until 55. They have to fucking survive by maintaining direct eye contact with a wall for 55 years in order to be pregnant for another 5. And depending on your outlook in life, this may be interpreted as a good or a bad thing, but it is currently being suggested that coelacanths may only have one mate throughout their entire life. Which is neat, because, you know, there's no cheating, there's no jealousy, they're happy with each other, spending the rest of their lives together incredibly mundanely, but simultaneously they're they're pregnant for five fucking years. I can't believe I'm at a point in life where I have to unironically say this, but it might legitimately be better if coelacanths were just a huge fan of adultery and kept having coelacanth orgies, so... I don't know. Whatever, I'm at the point in English class where I need to write a... What the hell is it called? Is it literally just called a conclusion? I thought there was a fancier name. Anyway, so in conclusion, I don't know if I would consider this animal a very good one. This thing has about as many redeemable qualities as I have clever metaphors. But in its mediocrity, its utter depravity, I find peace. Tranquility. It goes at its own pace, even if its pace is this, and mostly everything around it respects it in its own weird way. Respect in this case more so meaning the desire to not interact with it in any conceivable sense, but still, in its own sad sense, it's admirable. There may come a day where humanity as we know it will be gone, where the earth we walk on is simultaneously barren yet overflowing with life where skyscrapers or factories once booming with industry become little more than dilapidated ruins where avian animals that survived our extinction may make their homes and nests, or offer refuge for any animal that may be seeking shelter from the elements or possibly even potential predators, where nothing of us remains. And if that day were to come, Without human intervention, some animals will inevitably die off, while others will strive and become even better than they once were. The world as we know it would revert back to a primordial age where species were constantly adapting in an attempt to become the apex, and those who couldn't keep up would inevitably be swept away entirely. But even with all of this, even if the world as we know it is changed back to the primal and unending hunting grounds they once were, the coelacanths will still remain. They'll remain to do headstands, they'll remain to hang out in caves five inches apart because they're not gay, they'll stare at walls vigilantly with unflinching courage, and they'll survive. 
Hell, they're going to survive longer than almost any of us will. And with little regard to what they do in their limited lifespan on any philosophical or grandiose scale. They're happy with just existing, so they're going to exist. No matter how tedious or monotonous it may be, it was an existence that it wanted to be a part of, so it chose to exist. And I think that's just perfect. But not as perfect as today's sponsor, ha 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 Sorry. Uh, as I said previously, I am bad at transitions, and my computer was dead for over a week and a half, so I guess we're doing this. Do you like water? You should, however, if you're somebody who has a hard time consistently drinking it, I understand that entirely. Personally, I used to struggle with it a ton, especially because Kansas tap water is the worst thing in all of humanity, but... One thing I would personally recommend is water flavoring packets and tubs. There's a lot of really great packets you can try out. For example, I think the Starburst and Skittle ones are surprisingly decent, albeit extremely sweet. But by far the best ones I've had are the ones provided by these fellas, Gamersubs. So, firstly, the flavoring itself is really, really good. I mean, hell, while voicing over this video, I'm drinking some Blue Raz right now. But really, there's a lot of great options here, ranging from your standard delicious flavors a la Blue Raspberry, Strawberry, Grape, or Green Apple, to what the fuck. It's also keto-friendly, contains no calories or sugar, and if you choose to go for the caffeine option if you're a goblin like me with no sleep schedule, that is also organic. However, this is the point in the sponsor where I would usually go, ha ha, booba, I sure do hate anime, don't buy these please, because I have to resort to cheap reverse psychology tricks to lure in the weebs. But this time, things are different. Imagine my utter horror when I woke up the day before this video came out, to a DM from two fantastic people over there revealing their new product. Sus Bars. I'm 21 years old and I do not feel sufficiently Zoomer enough to understand what this is. I believe it is an Among Us. The two times I've played that game, I led a cult consisting of eight people against one of my exes by constantly quoting melodramatic Tal Dream lines as the fires of conflict were burning bright and there needed to be vengeance for the betrayed. And the other time, I was constantly stunlocked by nine viewers who kept on fucking killing me at the start of every round and pretending nothing happened for the rest of the game. Is this relevant? No. Does this relate to the new products? I don't know, but it is objectively a sus bar. Also, I guess on a slightly relevant note, I don't know if I've ever mentioned their shirts in any of these segments. That's not a new product, but it is a product I ignore for my own sanity. If you're interested in any of this, shame on you. But feel free to use the code that has been ominously floating on screen for eons now, or click the link in the description. Either way, if you've made it towards the end, thank you immensely for watching a sponsor and my slow descent into madness talking about a fish. A big thank you to my patrons, who I am unfortunately unable to list off currently, but your support means a lot. And lastly, a big thank you to Gamersups for providing me with sponsored segments and water flavorings by passive-aggressively insulting their business model, and I love you all. Parasocial relationships are always cool, and I don't know how to outro.